Thanks. Let me wake up my uh, machine here. Yeah, I'm a two-month-old baby at GitLab in, in product marketing for the first time. You know, it's, uh, it's funny. Since I joined all of two months ago, there are five or six more newer people just on my team. So uh, that's GitLab right now. If you want to like feel the pace of it, we're we're like a thousand people, just short of a thousand employees. And I had to check again today because yesterday it was in 62 countries, and today it's 63, because it's another day. Why not? We're in 63 countries. I uh, I Googled really hard for that image, so I hate to waste a perfectly good welcome slide. I know it's getting a little late for a welcome, but. Part of what I'm here to do is actually just to generalize the conversation a little bit, tell you a little bit more about GitLab, the company, the software. And uh, I believe it was actually promised I would talk about DevOps tool chains. So I will. It's true. I am Brian Glanz, and there I am. I actually did tweet something at the hashtag, because why not? It's pretty cool out there. Um, at GitLab, we work where we live instead of needing to live where we need to work. And I happen to live in like the building out the window. But uh, I, I have this urge to say welcome to GitLab at the top of the talk because I've been in your seat many times and lots of other companies. And you know, whether it's over at the spheres, actually that way, or like further that way, I was down at X, the uh, innovation labs, the research and development labs at Google. And I'm reminded of a time a buddy of mine's given the remarks at the top of the, of the day there, and largely a non-Google audience. And he's got this big like Hindi film narrator voice, like Amitabh Bachchan, and he says at the start of it, welcome to X. You know, and I'm just like goosebumps, because it's a super dramatic setting. And it occurs to me that this building, uh, which is just a building, but you know, the Space Needle is kind of like GitLab's building today. And we don't, we don't have a building. You know, those thousand people in 63 countries, they don't go to any one office. We don't have a headquarters to welcome you all to. But if you get more than a few of us in the same place and at the same time, because we're also asynchronous in all our work by default, um, and then customers and users and contributors, at that point, like somewhere in there, we've every right to say this is GitLab right now. So, so yeah, welcome to GitLab. And that's a little bit of context about the company. Uh, you've heard a little bit about me. I was, in fact, a developer. And as a consultant, I'm thinking, you know, for all the different operations I was inside of, uh, more than 100 different clients of different sizes uh, over the years, I don't know of another one who dogfooded quite as aggressively and in all the same ways as GitLab does. And that, that I, I sort of bring up because it was occurring to me, like, how do we get away with it? You know, back when we were just crossing the threshold into being a, what they were calling the first Ukrainian unicorn, or sometimes called a San Francisco-based startup or a Netherlands tech company, or of course, the first Ukrainian unicorn, because that's, like I said, just a bit of, of who we are and, and everywhere that we are. But I get this question a lot, and I always marveled at it before joining the company, like, how do we get away with it? And we, we get away with it by using GitLab, is actually, now that I'm on the, the other side, the inside of it, even this event organized in GitLab. Uh, so we use the product to develop the product. We also use the product to run the company. And that'll come back around and actually be relevant in one of these slides. Uh, let's pull at that DevOps question with software delivery. And this question you must have been told to think about so many times in recent years, how often do you release? And I like this needle for kind of pulling at the thread. I'll do this a few times in these slides. Like, think of the answer for yourself, and then we'll go survey says, and we'll show you the answer from lots of other developers, or in some cases, lots of other folks in, in IT on the ops side, or in security. Actually, how many people are uh, developers here? I'm looking around and already know some of the answers. Yeah. Just good to know. Quite a lot of the room, which makes sense. So how often do you release? 
I mean, we've all been told, and I must have told people a thousand times, it should be more often. But uh, in case this is small, I'm going to walk over here and do. So 2014 to 18, over five years, uh, this is a question asked by Forrester. These are you know, their data. Uh, this is their analysis. Um, I'm just bringing it to you. We all know we should be releasing more often, or so we've been told, but many teams are stuck. I think stuck is a fair word there. Over those five years, I'm actually really surprised there wasn't a lot more movement on that question. But if you zoom in on 2018 and then do uh, a 2019 version, finally like a little bit of loosening up. And Chris Kondo, the principal on this subject and related subjects at Forrester, this is him drawing a box and saying target zone. I, I don't disagree. If I disagree with Chris, I'll let you know, but I don't, uh, generally speaking, nor in this case. So there's a lot of questions about why. I mean, even like why, why so stuck, but also like why release more often matters. I think it's just a, it's an aspect of being agile, not like agile methodologies per se, but it's like, are you fleet of foot? <laughs> are you ready to react to an opportunity when it presents itself to, you know, an incident that, that requires releasing to, to respond to, to your competition, um, more quickly releasing something that's better and sooner than you expected? Over some of these same years, uh, Forrester 2013, 15, and 17, we're asking just developers uh, in general, are your organizations using an agile methodology, never mind which flavor? 2013, half were saying that fewer than 25% of their teams were using agile, and that script really flipped by 2017. Uh, exactly half, that is, right, in saying that more than 75% were using Agile. But here's another one of those survey says. So when you ask, are you using Agile? Oh, yeah, and lots of movement over those four or five years. But if you ask on the specific method level, I mean, just think of your own answers to these, and it doesn't really matter what you call them, like, do you do stand-ups, do you do sprints, do you do, you know, when you ask people more specifically, are you actually using these practices uh, associated with modern app development, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's what I remembered. Quite a gap. Right? If you ask people, like, are you using Agile? Or if you ask them, are you doing some of these specific things associated with one of the other, one of the other Agile methodologies? Not so much. And let's flip to the other side of DevOps and ask, uh, in this case, in the next few some IT professionals with responsibility over tool chain management. And they're telling Forrester, too many tools creates friction, kind of obvious. From, I guess a little bit of my consulting bias, I thought some of these numbers would be even worse, but two thirds is pretty bad on the lower right there. Uh, agree that handoffs between teams using different tools slows down delivery. Sure it does, right? And let's, let's pick at that just a little bit. As Chris Kondo headlines it, teams have too many tool chains and too many tools. So how many different software delivery tool chains in your organization? One, two, three to five, 20, <laughs> 21 plus? Yikes. Uh, thankfully, only 2% in the 21 plus club. But that's four and five with, with two or more tool chains. Uh, each of which, of course, are comprised of multiple tools. I might have flipped these charts, but how many tools per tool chain? <laughs> Again, with the 21 plus. Crikey. Uh, so, a solid half with six or more tools per tool chain, and four and five with two or more tool chains. So, sure, there's a lot of, there's a lot of rub there, plenty of friction to go around. Uh, who, who's actually feeling it? is the next question put to the same uh, IT professionals here. Who's responsible for maintaining all of that, keeping it all working? Yeah, the developers. We all kind of know that. But conveniently, 31 plus 19 is 50. So exactly half of these organizations know they have a problem to the extent that they have teams devoted to keeping these things working, DevOps teams, internal tools teams. Yeah, labor intensive. So let's pick up just a little bit of how the integration actually is done. 
And the way I read this one is that you want to be here, right? Out of the box solution, integrated end to end. And that, that jibes with the sort of one in five being in the old uh, promised land here. I don't know what, incidentally, well, I don't know how to read this last one. Our tool chain is not integrated. So is it, is it a tool chain? I, I'm not sure what that means. Thankfully, small, small answers there. But uh, you know, maybe it's wonderful. Maybe it's like, oh, we use one tool, so it's not an you know, IT people. That, you know, maybe it's like in the days of uh, you know, the sneaker net. Right? You'd put data on a thing and walk it across the office in your sneakers. Maybe it's, I don't know. If the human is the interface, then it's not an integrated, I don't know. I'm, I don't know what it means. Thankfully, they were asking the smart people this question. This is a little convoluted. We're looking at, of the, so the benefits you will, real, you will realize, or do you anticipate realizing if you're in that promised land, if you're in that one in five, with a, a fully integrated tool chain out of the box. And this is, I mean, I think some obvious ones, right? Like, yeah, improved developer productivity. We just saw the other side of that coin. Increased revenue, I'm, I'm impressed that pops as high on that list. And so these respondents are, are quickly connecting those dots between simplifying release, releasing more often, increasing revenue, right? Easy enough for them to connect the dots. I like this one, improved developer job satisfaction. Partly because I still get recruited, which is totally inappropriate, but I still get recruited as a developer. And the messaging in those things says stuff like, you know, it's a developer's paradise. You can use any tools you want. Is, it real, is that really like a paradise to be able to use any tools you want? No, you end up in, uh, you end up in the middle of this. And so I do, I do think that, uh, this situation actually leads to improved job satisfaction among devs. So in this case, we're only actually asking a subset. These are the folks who actually have an out-of-the-box tool chain management system. And then of the benefits they have realized, which do they, seeing ha do they see having the greatest impact on their business? An ability to deploy to any cloud somewhat to my surprise, really pops there, although I'm not surprised at all that three and four would agree they don't want to get locked in. I mean, who wants to be locked in? And, and why is multi-cloud important? I mean, I, I think this is fairly self-explanatory, but and it also uh, occurs to me that we're standing in an enormous uh, lightning rod in the middle of Cloud City, and I don't want to get struck down. But uh, yeah, don't let big cloud lock you in, right? Of course, they're developing lots of tools that are intentionally going to work uh, a little more smoothly if you're also, yeah, locked in. We all kind of know that. But it's nice to see that and correlated with these other data in, in these responses. So what can you do? Well, of course, look for something that doesn't lock you, okay, that allows you to deploy wherever is best for you, including on-premises. Uh, and, something that does just as much of this for you as possible. This is all still, uh, despite the little tanuki up in the corner, this is all still Chris Kondo's analysis. But you see where it's all going. You know where I work. You know I'm going to turn the corner on this. All of this lines up extremely well with having one tool to do as much of this for you uh, as possible. So let, let's talk about uh, GitLab. And Hayden talked about this uh, some, and, and some of these slides just flesh it out even a little bit more. GitLab is for developers. Sure, that's where it started, uh, for and by developers, with source code management uh, only. At some point, there was a, a big debate. There weren't a whole lot of people necessarily in the debate at that point. These were early days, like 2011, 2012. Uh, some of my history is a little fuzzy, and someone in here will, will tell the story a little better if you're interested. But there was a big debate over merging in GitLab CI, which was a separate thing, it was a separate code base with source code management. And perfectly reasonable debate with lots to be said on both sides. Like, there's a lot to be uh, said for the, the temptation of a real best in class tool that does this one thing uh, extremely well. But as soon as they did integrate them, it was obvious, at least there in that bubble, that what the benefits were, and that they were going to go 
toward developing things for the full DevOps lifecycle. It was just clear to them. It was, I think, initially a choice made based on their own needs for efficiency. Like they wanted to maintain one code base. They wanted to have one database. That was the size of the GitLab team at that point. But it became clear what the larger opportunity was and that they would be building uh, this company and this product out in that direction. So from the very earliest days of the company, GitLab is for DevOps was more where that was at. Now, I've already, uh, even in my two months, talked to plenty of people, and certainly in my 20-plus uh, years, talked to pl plenty of people who have even more logos on their crazy wall than this. Uh, yeah. And I don't think it's too much to call it a crisis. You know, it, not when you, you've got all that in your hands. And how bad is it really? It's pretty bad. So when you look at some of these sources, like the source on the 5.2 billy spent on DevOps tools in 2018, that source projects 15 plus billy being spent in 2023. Um, and still, like almost nine in 10 organizations are disappointed with their DevOps initiatives. And, and so you've got this stuff that, you know, the marketing people like me now will say it will dissolve, it'll digitally dissolve your silos. And then ironically, uh, because you've bought so many tools, you end up recreating those silos, you know, but per tool chain or per tool. And it's even harder to mitigate than the silos you were trying to buy your way out of. I don't know at this point that we need to say a whole lot more about this particular slide. We've all got enough context, except that I would add single user interface to that. I mean, just occasionally as a dev doing ops, that's invaluable to me. And I only have so much brain RAM. So if I'm trying to uh, chase down an incident or something, the less I can, the less I can do in the way of context switching, uh, the better for me. This and, and all of the maturity related to this, this is just one click off of our homepage. And, it, and I'm sure everybody in here has you know, more detailed interest in a lot of these areas. The fact that it's all up here is, uh, some of it's of course labeled as coming soon, but it's not to say it's, it's complete by any, by any stretch. I think we can say more so than anyone else that GitLab is a complete DevOps platform. It doesn't mean everything's feature complete, um, but we're pretty serious about, let me go ahead to, we're pretty serious about tracking down exactly how complete are we and when will we be where. Right, so which things do we consider lovable and they get a heart? Uh, not just because they've been around for a long time, but, but because we actually believe that's the best solution you can find for that thing. And there's also something in the mix, and, and quite a hot debate about this inside the company, and you're more than welcome to jump into those issue threads and join the debate, whether you work for GitLab or not. Um, any informed opinion is as much a contribution as a, as a feature or a fix. Uh, and there's a lot of debate about, like, at what point are you lovable? I would say review apps. I mean, I love our review apps. I know of customers buying the product just for that and, and who say they love it. So this is a little conservative for my taste. Maybe that's why I'm in marketing now. I wasn't before. It, we're, beyond just GitLab is for DevOps, we're, we're trying to stretch the definition of DevOps. And clearly, it's not just us. Like we heard earlier with, with DevSecOps, uh, that's not like just a word that we're making up. Uh, and I, I think it's not only fair but, but necessary to include security in DevOps. And as you see there, like as first class citizens, shortly after I joined the company a couple months ago, this tweet went out from the company account. Like when folks in ops are actually firing up their machines and, and GitLab as their main interface for getting their work done. And, and then, DFED, this guy David chimes in, he works in, in ops and in security and says, this day already came for me. Just reading it for the people in the back. Again, doesn't necessarily mean we're all the way there, but I think we can already say this as well. I very much do. It's been a year or two since we've been seriously adding to the security portion. These are all really big deals now that I'm looking at this. These aren't just like little features here and there. Uh, the up and to the right, the sort of pickup of the pace, it, it's here, I would say, like I bring it here partly just to say, you could doubt 
whether we'll actually be able to be feature complete or lovable in appreciable number of those different categories in a few years. You could doubt that, but if you looked at the, the growth inside of, of the product and its capabilities and other aspects of the growth of the company and, and the product, I, I'd bet we'd get away with it. I bet we would. And the community contributions themselves up and to the right. I hit the dashboard just off of this, and it's really interesting to click through. Uh, just in time to throw a couple more things in here. We've even got organizations hiring people to contribute. Uh, so that, that all is part of how it's coming together. And just to put a bow on it, the company's mission formally is everyone can contribute. Um, like I said, everyone at GitLab already uses GitLab to do their jobs. Like even this event is organized in GitLab, right? It's, and, and even in HR, which of course we call people ops because it's, everything is something ops. Uh, <laughs> Even they use GitLab every day to do their jobs. That's how we get away with being completely remote and, and asynchronous by default and, and, and still hold it all together and, and pretty well. And, and so this is already true for us. We want it to be true for everyone. And, and that's part of what it means for everyone can contribute. There's even sort of a more profound level to it. The company does a lot for you know, educational users and for open source projects, gives a lot away for free. And, and of course, so much is free and open source besides, but gives a lot of what would otherwise be paid away for free in, in all the right places. And there's even a larger version of the mission outside of just DevOps, which I think, I know from some of the conversations I had before coming up here, brings even some of us into the room today. Uh, we're not all just using GitLab for work necessarily. And that larger version, I saw somebody say it really neatly, which was to turn the nature of all digital work from read only to read write. And being like a little bit more technical in nature, that actually hit me even more than the sort of elegant version of the thing. That GitLab wants to make this a read write world. So I really liked that version of it. This version of it is great too. Uh, that's all I brought for conversation. Happy to go back and answer questions about any specific slides. We should also broaden this up and, and, and let anybody from GitLab or anywhere else answer questions. I don't think, the mic, I don't think my mic's working yet. <laughs> Do you think everything's good? All right, so let's give it up for Brian. Thank you, Brian. We're going to turn this into an open AMA, right? So there's a lot of GitLabbers here, so we're going to help Brian out. Um, if you have a question, ask it. That's what we're here for. We still got this place for, I think, uh, I don't know when it shuts down, maybe an hour and a half, hour. Uh, there's still some drinks. There's still some food. But this is your chance to ask a question. We'll walk around, and it's an ask me anything, right? So it's an AMA. Anyone have any questions? All right. I got two of these, so like if you... If I'm like, I don't know if I want his question, I'll hand him this. I promise it's not too terrible. Um, I worked in sales enablement for just a little while um, at a big sales org, and part of that was doing mindshare events. Um, I have a challenge at Disney where a lot of product managers, project managers specifically, say, hey, why would I use GitLab? I mean, it's got some of these things, but Jira is like my tool of choice, and Smartsheet and these other things that PMs are usually indoctrinated into. So I guess my question to GitLab would be, how do you guys plan on creating mindshare with non-technical people who use what's been considered at least traditionally a technical product? Anyone want to take it? So um, a good example that I was really shocked with um, was our legal department using GitLab, right? And, and using kind of a workflow of how they negotiate contracts and how they manage their their pipeline of, of, of work that they have to get through for the day, right? I was really shocked, and, uh, and that one head of legal was in Minneapolis, and I had a customer in Minneapolis, and they asked the exact question you had. And I was like, hey, Jamie, can you go present at this customer and just kind of walk through your workflow, your daily workflow, and why? And a lot of it was just, hey, I needed a place to just kind of organize all this stuff that is coming at me that's better than email, right? I mean, which is not, you know, that's a pretty low bar, right? Um, 
and then just to be able to pass work to other people when there's you know other people contributing back to it and it's a conversation it's just not lost in email and so since we had that in GitLab it just made sense I've had other customers ask the same thing and everyone's a little unique I think it's just smart to find some solution where you can collaborate and everyone can kind of contribute and there's kind of an audit trail of what's going on that's my answer to this question does anyone else want to jump in oh you're known as dojo if you're So uh, my take on that is, as with everything else at GitLab, it's an iterative process. And we've gotten to a point now where I think we've satisfied a lot of end users or engineers or developers' needs. And the next evolution of that, the next iteration, is to get feedback from those project managers who say, I can't live outside of JIRA. So we are actively seeking that feedback, so it would be great if we could interface with people like that, that have that stance saying, this isn't gonna work for me. Well, we need to figure out why, because we are satisfying a lot of engineers and developers' needs from a project management issue tracking perspective, but now we need to get the non-developers feedback. It will take a while to prove out, and you have to have your early adopters just like with any product. Um, but that's what my focus is the next year is figuring out things to happen. Um, so, we love to collaborate. Yeah. So, challenge accepted in the back left corner. All right. Any other questions? All right. Uh, you mentioned the uh, feature flags earlier. Uh, when can we expect? feature flag application in GitLab? I, uh, I don't know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, in the back. Josh Lambert in the back. I don't know if, uh, here you go. Sure, thanks. Uh, so right now we have uh, a, a baseline feature flag function, which uh, we've been iterating upon. Um, so it's based on the Unleash API. So you can use the Unleash client libraries within your application. Um, and you can control the feature flags um, within the GitLab portal or the GitLab uh, user interface. Uh, I think we did just recently roll out some uh, like progressive deployment capabilities. And so you can target certain percentages of users. And so um, we are iterating there. Um, and so it kind of will depend on how mature and robust of a feature that you need. Um, but essentially, we're on a trajectory there on feature flags, and we've been iterating on it across the last couple of months. Um, so it's continuing to get better. Uh, and um, yeah, it, it'll depend on sort of where your needs are versus uh, you know kind of kind of our, our ramp up. Um, but uh, so we can talk offline. But um, we've it, it, it works now, and and we've just added the progressive deployment capabilities, and we'll, we'll keep on going. So we'd love to learn more about what you're looking for and what you need. Great question. On our roadmap, there's probably uh, an epic about feature flags, and I would highly recommend you contribute and say, I like this, I don't like that, and please do this. And the more people that raise their hand, the, make, the easier it is for Josh to help steer the ship, is how I would say it. Um, but that's a great question. Um, I don't know, maybe Hayden looks like he's going to get creative. He might pull that up, I don't know. Any other questions? I got a question. It's more like a quiz. Does anyone know when GitLab releases? Uh oh, someone in the back. Wait. 22nd of? Every month. Every month. Like clockwork. Like clockwork. Have we missed it? Not that I've experienced in three years. All right. Not, yeah, same here. I've only been here two and a half and it never happened. And I send out an email to a lot of people. They're like, man, you got to stop sending me that email. Anyways. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Oh, in the back. Back left corner is kind of a hot, hot zone. So I'm just curious, with uh, continuous deployments and delivering more often, 
what's the plan to move towards weekly, daily, et cetera, with GitLab releasing? I'm going to pass that back to Josh Lambert. Yeah, thanks. So uh, on GitLab.com, we are releasing weekly now. Um, so uh, we have a new uh, website up at GitLab.com or about.gitlab.com slash releases slash GitLab hyphen com, where you can see like what features shipped to GitLab.com that aren't yet available in the GitLab like self-managed release package. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out. Um, it's possible they might be behind the feature flag, so they might not they might be merged but not totally deployed yet. Um, but that's an easy way to check out like what's coming. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're weekly. We're working on driving that down to be more quick, uh, to be uh, more rapid. Um, and uh, essentially, uh, we I think we're ta tackling some of the availability challenges on .com first before we keep on driving forward. But we're at weekly now, and we end to keep on going. But we want to make sure we keep it up first. Um, and then on self managed. I think we feel like a monthly release is about the right cadence for folks as far as a monthly feature release. Um, and that, that it's, it's pretty quick for most self-managed releases. Uh, but um, we actually find that uh, like 30% of users are essentially within N minus one of the release. So it's pretty good. And I think it's like just under 50% are within N minus, like completely N minus three. Yeah. So. Um, we, we keep a close eye on that and make sure upgrades are reliable, people are taking them. But I, th I think we feel pretty comfortable that's a good cadence, but love feedback as far as if you want feature releases faster um, or or if that's about right for how fast people can sort of ingest upgrades at this point in time. Good question. Uh, good discussion, Josh. Um, how frequently do you upgrade Jason? Um, so we're self-managed, uh, and we are typically on a made or a feature release on the 22nd. We're we usually wait for the first patch release or seven days, whichever comes first. All right. Is it manual? Is it automated? It's all automated. Um, we basically just go out and say, "Hey, we're ready for the latest release." We put in the uh, the version that we want, which is latest, and it pulls down and updates for us, all in a, uh, no downtime. Um, I have applied security patches in the middle of the day um, with no issues. Awesome. You've earned another drink. OK. Any other questions? All right. We are here. It is raining like kind of hard, so good luck getting out of here. Um, you could have another drink. You could have some more food. If you have more questions, what we really want you to do is contribute communicate, collaborate with each other. Apparently, if it starts with the letter C, that's kind of what we do now with events. Like, there's contribute, commit. Uh, what was today? Connect. Connect, right? Whatever. I mean, so we'll eventually run out of C words and come up with something else. I don't know. Who knows? Um, any other questions? Well, I stalled for a little bit. Yeah. Uh, so do you have any local GitHub or anything like that? You can share so the question was, do we have like a local meetup or a local user group here in Seattle? Is that correct? That was your question? I don't know. I don't live here. Uh, Joe D. Coming soon. Coming soon, right? So Joe is your rep in Seattle. Um, <laughs> sounds like John's got something to say. Yeah, that was a that was a bad thing this week. We're gonna avoid that, right? Yeah. yeah. So on something else. Okay. Kyle James on LinkedIn. He's wide open for a meetup and happy to share what's going on at Disney. And uh, we're waiting for his new channel. My kids paid for three years of with their allowance. They just keep asking me, when is it coming? I'm kidding. So this is just another tip. If you ever want to give your kids an allowance, I use $2 bills so they can't use it in vending machines because I'm an evil dad. But anyways, um, yeah, here comes Hayden. Uh, we decided not to get involved in uh, 
the GitLab meetups because uh, we want the community to drive those. Um, these GitLab Connect events are kind of the equivalent of a GitLab Inc. sponsored meetup. Uh, so that's, you can consider this kind of a meetup. Uh, but the true meetups are, are pretty much run by the GitLab community. So we, we generally stay hands off, if that makes sense. Yeah, there's like a process. I have one I'm setting up in Minneapolis for my customers and I'm letting them drive it and own it. Like we just kind of, here's the template, you go, we're out of it kind of situation. So Kyle just, you know, it sounds like he just took it all on here today. It's recorded, so yeah. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Any other questions, comments, feedback? All right. Like I said, we're here for a while. There's still coffee, beer, wine, whatever else you like. Um, thank you for coming out. Go ahead and put a round of applause for yourself for coming out today, right? You skipped out on work. Hopefully you learned something. All right, take care.